Miyoko Shinner, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hi, Howie. How are you? Great. I'm so happy to be talking to you again. You've uh, you've been busy over the last several years since we we talked. I've had a few things going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I want to talk to you about this the journey of of building an ethical brand of playing in the marketplace, of making decisions and having to weigh different options. But uh, first, I'm just curious, um, what was the thinking when you decided, I guess you'd written um, Artisan Vegan Cheese in 2014? 2012. 2012, okay. You clear, you put everything into that book. Like there was no secrets. There was no, I'm going to withhold some stuff that, you know, and I know that partly because like a month after the book came out, you emailed everybody, hey, I've just figured out a better way to make the buffalo mozzarella, <laughs> right? And it's on my website. So use that instead of the other one. And so you're giving it all wow, away. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah. Well, because I ended up uh, writing it out in the back of the book and oh, making, okay. making a note like, no, no, not this one, that one. But, you know, so you're, you're clearly like your goal in that book was just to give this to everybody. So yes, absolutely. My goal in the book was to empower people to get in their kitchens and make something that wasn't commercially available. Back then, you know, this was, I mean, my plan was not to start a company. Uh, my plan was to, was to arm people with the know-how to make their own cheese because vegan cheese was not readily available. I mean, the only things that were in the marketplace were the oil and starch variety, you know, made by a couple of companies that are still around. But, you know, I don't really consider that cheese in the true sense of the word, meaning uh, a food that's made from milk, that's fermented, that has microbes in it and bacteria and enzymes and all this biological magic happens, which makes milk into cheese. And, uh, you know, what was in the marketplace then, there were only about two brands, weren't really, in my opinion, they, were, they served a purpose but it was more of a processed cheese alternative. Mm -hmm. right. And I wanted people to be, to embrace the art of cheese making, of vegan cheese making in their own homes. Um, you know, just as man, humankind had made dairy cheese for, for centuries, I wanted that magic to be shared with everybody. Um, mm. You know, so that, that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, and it's funny because there's so much about human culture, and I, you know, the word culture, of course, has, mm -hmm. has multiple meanings, that you know, we grew up um, partly with, with animal agriculture. And there's so, there's so many, like, I know people who are hunters who have a really strong ethos about how that makes them human. And you know, in talking to Josh Lajani, who was a hunter, he's still pursuing that in terms of preserving wildlife and being, getting to know your environment. And that's, it kind of reminds me of that, that sort of playing around with microbes and fermentation and creating these delicious products is a part of our human heritage that it, it'd be sad to lose. Yeah, I completely agree. Now, I'm not sure I agree with the hunter, <laughs> uh, it, you know, uh, example of uh, preserving wildlife. We, we could have a whole yeah. uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't mean that you, you preserve yeah. wildlife by hunting, but that- Well, well hunters do say that. Right. No, what I'm saying is that yeah. it, that the, what people get say they get from hunting oh, is to be embedded in an environment, to know your environment, to be part of an ecosystem. And you can do that as a vegan. You can. You can do it even more so as a vegan because we're not taking away from anything, hopefully. So and we're not depriving another being of the life that he or she wants to live. Um, but yes, I, I agree. You know, I think it's, we get very excited, you know, when we grew up, I assume you and I grew up watching the Jetsons, you know, on <laughs> yeah. TV and the, and, uh, or the Twilight Zone, or, you know, just imagining what life was going to be like sometime in the future when we were just going to be popping pills instead of sharing meals and things like that. But <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, we are, we are Part of a culture we're an evolving we're a, we're evolving as a culture but to recognize from where we have come you know from from the places that the origins from which we evolved uh and it, the continuum of all of that and to really embrace it and to understand it and to take away learnings that are valuable and leave behind 
the, the ones that we need to reconsider and do better on. I think that's part of our human evolution. So um, the art of fermentation is beautiful. The fact that uh, we learned how to make cheese out of milk over 2000 years and really perfected that craft, um, we no longer need to have milk from an animal, mm -hmm. but we did learn an art form. We did create an art form. And to be able to preserve that into the future and evolve it into, uh, to give it new meaning, a new life form, um, I think it's a beautiful thing. And it's not something just to leave behind and say, well, we're not going to make cheese that way anymore. We're just going to do it in the laboratory with oil and starch. Mm. Um, you know, to me, that leaves me feeling very cold. There's no story. There's no soul to that. Which I'm guessing there's a way in which you really had to honor the traditional dairy cheese making tradition in order to transcend it. I, I absolutely did. I had to study it. I mean, I read books. I watched videos. Uh, I even took classes in cheese making. Now I didn't, I was the only student who didn't partake in the sampling of the cheeses, <laughs> but I really needed to understand the science. I, um, I really needed to understand the art, what was involved um, and, and how was it different with plant milks? And I can tell you, you know, dairy milk, there, there's really only three milks that, they, that humankind's are making cheese out of. There's cow's milk, sheep's milk and goat's milk. Um, I mean, I, I assume you can make cheese out of, you know, mother's milk, human mother's milk and buffalo, or whatever. Well, buffalo milk as well, too. But, um, you know, elephant milk, but, but they haven't. Um, it's the European culture that started cheese making uh, primarily out of um, cow's milk and the other two species. Uh, well, three species, buffaloes as well. Um, but plant milks, when you look at the plant kingdom, there are so many different kinds of plant milks. There are the kind that you find in the supermarket and then there are so many more. You can make milk out of so many different kinds of legumes, seeds, nuts, grains, and every single one of them has a different nutrient profile. The proteins are different. Uh, the protein structures are different. You know, the, the peptides are different. The fatty acid profiles are different. The starch profile, all of it is so radically different you can't expect it to behave exactly the same way as dairy milk. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, why'd you choose cashews? Well, you have to, it's just like getting, you have to get to know your milk. And so um, as I played around in the very beginning with all these different plant milks, I realized that they all reacted differently to fermentation. Some didn't taste very good. Some tasted great. Some, some coagulated, some didn't. And I had to get to know at least one, one ingredient really well uh, in order to be able to write a book. And so that, you know, that became cashews. And, and people say, well, can I just interchange them with something else? And you really can't because it's just because they all act differently. I think I just kind of skipped around and went off topic yeah. here for a second. But. No, no, the, the, the topic is cheese yeah. and you and it's all <laughs> fluid yeah it's all it's all it's all in the it's all fluid until it coagulates right that's right that's exactly right <laughs> um so what was the impetus to say okay i'm going to start commercial production you know to be perfectly honest um i've been an entrepreneur for the last you know really since my mid-20s when i went vegan i've always had different businesses and my goal at the time that i wrote the book was never to start another business uh, <laughs> I felt like I wasn't good at it and uh, it was exhausting. Um, and I still hadn't reconciled the idea of having a business, which is a profiteering enterprise with my ethics, um, with you know trying to change the world. And I just didn't see how the two could jibe. Um, and I, I struggled with that issue uh, pretty much my whole life. Um, and so um, I was determined never to have yet, never to have another business. But um, as I, you know, after I wrote the book and I went around the country doing cooking demos and speaking engagements, people kept saying, oh my God, it's an amazing book. I never thought I could do this. And I did it once and I never want to do it again. So <laughs> can't you just start a company and I'd rather just buy the cheese. So, and I just kept hearing it over and over and over again. And eventually I just thought, okay, you know, I really, really need to do this. Um, the real impetus, I think in the end, the thing that sort of 
uh, you know, really uh, pushed me over the, the hurdle to where I felt like, okay, I can do this was, um, was uh, Seth Tibbet, the founder of Tofurky. Uh, you know Seth, right? I don't. You don't? Okay. Don't. Well, anyway, so, you know, Seth is uh, uh, one of the originals and he's a legend in the industry, but um, he and I caught up with each other after uh, not seeing each other or talking to each other for a long time. And um, he had some of the cheeses that I was making. He said, wow, if you decide to go back into business, I'll be an investor. And so that was really kind of what gave me the confidence, I think. You know, enough people were saying, can't you just start another business? I'd rather, I'd rather buy the cheese. But it was really Seth that just sort of um, pushed me over the finish line to where I thought, okay, you know what? I do need to do this one more time. So had you, as, a, as, as an uh, entrepreneur, had you ever taken investment before? Um, well, when I'd had my last business um, back in the 1990s, I had, but we're talking very small investments, like $5,000 from mm -hmm. a few people. So friends and family, uh, not like this, you know, this company. So mm -hmm. this was, it, it's a wholly, it's a whole different game. Back in the 1990s, um, I had a meat alternative company before, you know, before meat alternatives were cool. Um, when you're always trying to explain to people why you were making meat alternatives. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> Today, you don't have to explain because everybody just wants to know what the latest and greatest is. But back then it was like, so why are you making this? Why don't you just eat chicken? You know, that, that was kind of where it was back then. Um, but um, it was just a different time. I remember actually pitching to a room full of investors and people coming up to me afterwards saying, you are a great presenter. Your story is fantastic. Um, I love the concept of your company. And in the middle of this dot com, you know, uh, it was a dot com boom. Um, your food business just isn't relevant. I mean, no one actually said that to me. Um, they all came up to me and told me what a great, you know, pitch I had given, et cetera. But no one gave me any money. I mean, back then, you know, all the money was going to dot coms. This was in the uh, like mid. 1990s mid to late 1990s right and, right if you're not if you're not selling vaporware nobody's interested no that that's exactly right it was just a completely different world back then nobody was giving the time of day to an innovative vegan company that was trying to do something cutting edge no one could see that there was even a problem people didn't even understand then that meat was a problem that milk was a problem and so why there was no problem to be solved and so why give money to a vegan company? And so I had, I just could not raise money. Mm. And so I'd gotten to a certain size with, you know, the initial, uh, whatever it was, $25,000, $50,000 or so I had raised from um, friends and family, plus a loan I got from um, the city of San Francisco. But you get to a certain point in growth, you need that X, you need more cash infusion to get to the next step. And I just couldn't raise any money. And I was exhausted. I just couldn't do it anymore. You know, I was working night and day and um, I didn't have a team. I mean, today I have, you know, I've got, I've got a sales team and a marketing team and quality and human resources and R&D. We have all these different departments. Back then, um, I had an office manager and I had a bookkeeper. And everything else was me. I was, mm -hmm. it was me, you know, and then of course I had the production folks, but otherwise it was just me, myself and I doing sales, marketing, you know, human resources, whatever, whatever it was. So. Right. So, so now, so when, um, so when Seth comes to you and says, I'll invest, he's not talking about 5,000 or 10,000 and he's talking about putting his name up and helping you get, like the money you need to build facilities and this team that you talked about, was, was, was there any part of you that was like, I don't want to touch this? No, no, I knew that, it, you know, I, when I thought about it, I realized that um, the idea had potential, but I couldn't do it, at, do it alone. This is a very different time when Seth was starting his business, when I was starting my business and Seth started a decade and a half or so before I started my business in the 1990s, I think Seth started in the, in the late 70s or so, maybe early 80s. Anyway, um, back then you could grow a company organically to some degree. It was getting harder in the in late 90s 
And it got harder even in the 2000s, you know, to grow organically because the whole industry was changing. And as you know, when you were involved in Purple Carrot, you know, now the time is completely different. In order, people are expecting company growth to happen much faster. They're expecting market penetration at a much faster rate than ever before. There's so much more demand and you have to be able to supply that, uh, that demand um, in, in a uh, timely fashion or the more, they just switch to somebody else. And so, you know, today it's very, very hard to just start a company, start small and grow over the next 20 years. I mean, you can do that, but if you're trying to have market impact and for companies such, such as ours that um, these so-called disruptive companies we're in it not just as a business, we're in it to have an impact on the world. We're in it because as you know, Greta Thunberg says, or the IPCC report says, we don't have a whole lot of time left to fix things here on this planet. And so we have to overhaul the entire economy, the food system, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I realized that, and I realized that, um, you know, we had to, to grow relatively quickly and have as big of an impact as possible. Mm. So how did you deal with that concern you talked about earlier about profiteering versus ethics? Because you know, at a, at a small scale, it's a little problem. Yes. Right? At a big scale, it's a big problem or a big opportunity. How, how did you talk to yourself or how, you know, how, did, how did you evolve and what, where are you now? Well, what, where I realized, what I realized was that um, industry economy was one of the biggest ways businesses could impact change in a way that you know, many other enterprises really simply couldn't um, because people need food, people need access to solutions. Um, and so if, if people are eating uh, foods that are produced in a broken food system, if you can replace that, you're actually having a greater impact. So I could sit and preach all day long. I could go around the country uh, like that with that Charlie, um, Charlie Brown stand, you know, that says advice. For example, I could just go around the entire world with my little advice stand and uh, a megaphone and talk about climate change and how everyone should go vegan. Um, and then people would come up to me and say, but what am I going to do about the cheese? I'm addicted to cheese. And if there's no solutions for them, and even though I'd written a book, people still don't want to make the cheese, then, um, then I haven't won. We mm -hmm. haven't won. The world hasn't won. And so uh, if we want the world to change, it's important for industry to lead the charge by providing solutions that make it easier for people to make the change. And therefore, I finally realized that uh, if you had the right kind of business, it wasn't that business was evil. We all have to, I mean, we're all, there's just businesses everywhere. The business doesn't have to be just about profit. The pr true profit is winning together as a people. The true profit is saving the world. The true profit is all of us, all living creatures, finding peace. And I realized that business could help do that. Hmm. Okay, it's beautiful. So you then, you know, how did you figure out like what the steps were? Like, I wouldn't know how to hire, like who to hire. I would probably like, you know, get in trouble for having the wrong conversations and I, like, you know, there's so many things I wouldn't know how to do to build the company. Um, how, did, how did you navigate the early days? Well, you know, I, I had a whole bunch of other little businesses in the past. So I learned, I had learned from them mm. uh, to some degree. Um, and the other way you learn is you keep making mistakes um, and you get to, you know, you make it, you think you know how to do something. So you do that little thing and then you run into a wall and you make a mistake and then you go, ah, I shouldn't have done it that way. I should have done it this way and you rethink it, and then you do it better next time, and you just keep building on that. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I also got to a point where I realized that I needed coaching, I needed help. I got a CEO coach that helped me think through a lot of my problems. Um, 
you know, I mean, even things like how to interview, how do you make sure that you're interviewing for the right, you know, um, God, I used to be so afraid of interviewing people mm-hmm. for jobs because I wasn't sure how do I do this right? How do I make sure I'm asking the right questions? And um, I read a bunch of books on how to do it. I think that really helped me. Um, and, uh, you know, every time I did it, I learned, oh, you know what? And, and, and well, actually, every time you run the company, you, you know, the more you run the company, you realize the things that are important. Um, and then you learn to um, refine your questions. So um, you ask those questions. And you also learn to sell yourself and explain how to do that. Um, so it's all a learning experience. You know, you basically continue to make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. Um, you also surround yourself with people that um, are more knowledgeable in various areas. For example, I'm not an HR expert. Of course, I, you know, when you're a business owner, you do have to learn almost every aspect of the business to a certain degree because you need to know whether or not someone is just, you know, bullshitting you from another department, for example. Um, um, and you have to be able to know that, you know, uh, the information, the knowledge that, that they bring from uh, their field, you know, that it's a cut above your own pay grade in that, in that area. So you do have to know something about everything. Um, and, you know, there's lots of books and tutorials and lots of help you can find. There are CEO mastermind groups. Um, there's all kinds of organizations you can tap into as well. Um, so, you know, you're really not completely lost, but every organization is different. And the things that are important to every organization also is, um, can differ. And so uh, you're never going to know all the answers that you, you know, from, from the get-go. You just won't. You just won't. And no, nor will any expert who comes and joins you. So... One of the things you had to do to get the company started was convince people that it was probably going to be a success. Now, I remember tasting your cheese. I think we had an event at some some downtown place in Portland at the Vita Vegan Con. I've had it at um, uh, NAVS, the North American Vegetarian Society. So I was like, oh, of course that's going to be a success. And there's a lot of great ideas that don't pan out and a lot of great foods and great entrepreneurs that for one reason or another just sputter and die or never take off. What were investors looking for? What was the, what were the, what was the evidence that was going to help them invest in confidence? You know, were you just like making cheese for people or doing surveys or market testing? Yeah, I really didn't do any market testing. I really was just making cheese for people um, and just telling my story. Um, And the, you know, I think, it gave some people, the earlier in, um, investors, some confidence that I'd had experience before running a couple of other smaller companies. Um, and so I knew the industry a little bit, um, you know, that I had a track record of, of writing books. Uh, there was quite a following already um, from writing the vegan cheese book. So I think that gave a degree of comfort. But honestly, I have to admit that the initial investors, which were mostly family and friends, um, plus, um, you know, Seth, and then, um, that also led to a few other people. Um, Seth introduced me to a couple of other, um, folks that invested, um, you know, they were taking a chance and to be honest, um, I wasn't as confident as I am today. Um, back then I was really, one of the reasons I didn't want to start another business was I didn't want to lose anyone's money because Mm -hmm. no one got a return on the investment in my previous company back in the night, the meat alternative company. You know, we basically, I sold the company just to get out of debt. So I sold it for the amount of the debt Mm -hmm. and uh, no one, no one was ever repaid. And so I didn't want to make that mistake. I was so concerned that I was going to lose everyone's money. And that was another reason, you know, that was the primary reason I was determined never to start a business. I just figured I didn't have that Midas touch to turn something into gold. Um, so I was very, very afraid of that. My, my idea, and I discussed this with Seth, is that we were going to start small uh, and just build kind of demand locally um, or among you know passionate vegans, et cetera. Um, and then we would take it step by step. We'd walk, crawl, and then walk, and then run. Mm-hmm. And uh, unfortunately, I think we started out by crawling and the idea was sell things online and then we were going to open up and the walking part was going to be 
proof of proof of concept by having a little retail shop. Okay. And then the running was going to be going national. And we skipped the walking part. We went from crawling to running because within three months, Whole Foods and NorCal wanted the product. And then a, within a year, we were nationwide, um, you know, in several thousand stores. So mm-hmm. it, it just grew very, very quickly. And we um, outgrew the capacity for our production facility uh, within a year and a half. And we were very, very strained there for three years trying to, we never filled any, we never filled all the orders. We were just constantly, uh, you know, running at about um, 70% fill rate, meaning about 30% of the orders were, were never being filled because we mm. just couldn't. Uh-huh. How, did, how did Whole Foods uh, find out about you and decide they wanted you in the stores? Um, actually, we, um, I went to a consumer show. We went to a, a, ve- uh, a, vegeta- a veg fest. That's what they're called. <laughs> it's been so long. So we went to the Sonoma Veg Fest and I was just selling cheese there. And um, a distributor came up, a local vegan distributor came up and said, wow, this is a great product. And um, I bet Whole Foods would be interested. So, um, you know, would you be interested in presenting this to Whole Foods? And I was like, yeah. Huh. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so, so you, you grew very rapidly. Um, and what did, you, what did you learn about cheese making as you were growing? Yeah, so, you know, for a long time, um, the cheese making, what I realized about the cheese making was it was a very different thing, uh, making small batches at my house. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, we were going to these, uh, these larger batches, which were, they, they were still small. We were making 40 pound batches. Um, and, uh, and then it wasn't really, well, okay, let me, let me backtrack. In Fairfax, in my small facility making 40 pound batches, I don't think I learned a whole lot because it was relatively similar to what was happening when I did it at my home. Where things really changed. Oh, actually there was something interesting. I'm backtracking. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it turns out we had an aging room. So our cheeses were aged just like dairy cheese. So we had an aging room and it was a rudimentary aging room. I didn't have the money to put in a fully stainless steel aging room. So we had um, uh, galvanized uh, steel in there. Um, galvanized isn't supposed to rust. Well, after several months of this aging room being full of cheese, we noticed this white powder being formed on the galvanized. And then we brushed off the, the white powder and noticed that it was rusting. Huh. And I'm, you know, I talked to the, the, uh, the installer, the refrigeration specialist and what was going on. They're like, I don't know, I've never seen this before. And I started Googling it and couldn't find anything. And I finally um, realized, I can't remember what it was, I was like, what is this white powder? What can form this white powder? And it turned out it was acetic acid. So basically it turns out when you ferment vast amounts of cashews and who would know this? Cause no one has ever fermented vast amounts of cashews. It actually emits acetic acid into the air. So oh. then it goes into the air, which caused the corrosion of the galvanized steel. So this is probably the first time in the 2000 year history of recorded cheese making that anyone had ever seen something like this before because no one had ever done it before. So that was really interesting. Um, and then when we moved into this new facility, uh, we built a new facility in uh, 2017, moved in here at the end of 2017. Uh, and, you know, this is a big facility with, with you know, large pieces of equipment. Uh, we're making batch sizes now of, you can hear water being lapped up in the background. That's my dog drinking water. Okay. Um, but anyway, um, we went to making uh, 1000 kilogram batches from 40 pound kilogram batches. Um, we found more interesting things happen. And for a while with the equipment that we had installed, the cheeses never coagulated. So we were using the same method we had at 40 pounds, but the cheese stopped coagulating. Now I can't tell you 
the science behind it right now because I'd be giving away some trade secrets at this point. I'm no longer publishing these books on uh -huh. mass manufacturing, only on how you make it at home. But basically, um, we had to change our processes to, to create uh, coagulation. We, we had to learn how to recoagulate these Jesus. Uh-huh. Gotcha. Um, so let's, so um, you mentioned you, you've got trade secrets now. You, you also have a lot of competitors. Yes. Uh, virtually all your competitors mm -hmm. pay homage to you. <laughs> they all started with your book. Um, what's your feeling about the, the, the vegan cheese landscape? Well, you know what? I like to say that my book was the one that it's the book that launched a thousand cheese companies. <laughs> And it brings me great pride. Now, I, I really do. I, I'm happy. You know, I visited a, a vegan cheese shop in, in Hungary, in Budapest, and I walked in and the woman, the proprietor, it was a tiny little hole in the wall shop. And the proprietor came out and she just gasped and she goes, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> she was so thrilled. Um, and, uh, you know, I visited um, a little uh, cheesemonger in London. Um, same thing happened. Um, uh, let's see, I uh, met a, a young lady in Singapore making vegan cheese, had also learned from my book. Um, I, honestly, I'm, you know, it's, I'm, it's flattering, but I wrote the book so people could be in power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't write the book so people wouldn't make cheese. I mean, you know, that's, it's just like dairy cheese. Dairy cheese, I mean, who owns the trade secrets of dairy cheese? Companies have their own per, their own proprietary secrets for a particular cheese, but the whole, whole idea of fermenting milk and turning it, coagulating it, and, and aging it and brining it—that is a well-known science. People go to school for that, and I'm hoping at some point people will go to school to learn the art of vegan cheese making and then put their own personal spin on it. We can't overtake animal dairy unless we can completely sub out all the products there are. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's not, it's not just up to my company to do that. We need many different companies making many different kinds of, of, of cheeses. I mean, the goal isn't for my company to succeed. Of course, I want my company to succeed. Of course, I want to be the premier leading cheese company in the world. But I want many others to join the fold because that's how we win together. Mm, love it. Um... Yes. Oh, so over I've been following, you know, your Facebook posts over the years and they get a lot of commentary and they're very often tackling challenging topics. And one of one of the things is like you are known for being sort of very pure in your advocacy. And now all of a sudden you kind of have to balance the the, the purity of veganism with business concerns, with who's investing in companies that are, that are supplying you, um, where, you know, what are the conditions among the cashew workers? What, um, how do you navigate the, you know, what, what now has come to be, you know, you're a very public figure. Like I was thinking about this this morning, like, Get, like for in terms of name recognition, you're by far the most name recognized person I've ever talked to on this podcast because you may named a company after yourself. How, how do you navigate public expectations and projections onto you? Well, I think we have to all remember that we're all human. Um, I don't know. I and mean, there's no such thing as being a, other than being a pure human, meaning I am human. <laughs> um, you know, I think purity is perhaps... Um, overrated. I think one of the dangers is when people start to idolize or have these uh, idealized uh, perceptions of people. That's when they're setting themselves up for the greatest disappointment when the person that they perceive to be absolutely faultless or, or infallible or pure um, does something that somehow jars the ethics of the perceiver. Um, and so, you know, that is definitely happening to me a lot more because we don't live in a pure world. I'm not an angel. I'm not a saint. <clears throat> I'm a human being trying to figure out the best way to do things in an imperfect world <clears throat> where everything isn't black and white, especially right now. We're navigating, um, we're navigating through gray waters, through turbulent 
gray waters, stormy waters, trying to um, quell the, the violence and um, the horror that's surrounding animals and this planet. And to get from here to the promised land uh, is going to be rough seas. And you know things aren't black and white. Um, we're not going from a, a world of animal agriculture overnight to a vegan world. We're gonna have to navigate the infrastructure that exists today, which is wrought with animal ag and, you know, I don't know, um, exploitation of every single kind. So we have to figure out what's the, what's going to have the biggest impact, uh, what's got the least harm, et cetera. It's about doing the best. It's not about perfection. So at Miyoko's, we've done everything we can, and I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but we do everything we can to vet our supply chain, to make sure that we are, uh, uh, you know, ensuring the, the highest standards of practice for uh, worker treatment, environmental protection, et cetera, for all the ingredients that we source. Um, we have, um, you know, we try to maintain the best practices here uh, as well at Miyoko's. Um, and even with investors, I try to make sure, for example, right, uh, our most recent uh, Series C uh, was led by Power Plant Ventures, which is um, a VC that invests only in plant-based businesses. Mm. Um, you know, we didn't, um, I don't want to say we didn't take blood money. We'll put it that way. Um, mm. We could have, I guess, but, but we didn't. Um, and I wouldn't even call it blood money because, um, you know, if you remember when Beyond Meat took uh, money from Tyson, and uh, a lot of people were really irate with Beyond Meat about that. But Tyson expressed an interest in uh, the, the new, the alt protein landscape. And uh, the CEO at the time even made a comment saying, well, I don't know if the future, you know, the future could uh, mean that protein will come more from plants and from animals. And so they realized that Beyond Meat was on a path to, uh, to really uh, setting the the, the landscape for the future of, of protein, and they wanted to take a part in that. Um, a lot of these corporations, it's not like they're they're committed to torturing pigs or animals. They're they, they're just in it for the money, and they'll follow the money. If the money is all protein, they're going to go down there eventually. Mm -hmm. So, this is something that I think you know. A lot of times, vegans are our own worst enemies because they're not looking at it with a long lens. They're looking at it very, very myopically at like what's happening right now. This is an evil corporation. Don't let them touch you. And um, the fact is, you know, we're not in a vegan world right now and there's going to be some mixing of companies. Um, we can't operate in a completely pure faction, fashion. But for example, if, um, well, for example, we have a co-manufacturer that makes some of our products for us. And we started this relationship last year. Um, well, that co-manufacturer, they're doing so well with our products. They're devoting more and more of their production time and space and building new space that's going to be exclusive just to us, mm -hmm. even though they're a dairy manufacturer. Uh -huh. So to me, that's a good thing because maybe eventually they'll become plant-based entirely. Um, does that make I mean, sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a like part like I can hear it feel in my own psychology. The part of me is like, well, people need to be better, and so my activism, I'm going to try to get people to be better. But realistically, yeah. that's a really like you're not going to make a big change if you're relying on people to be better. People will make a change when your cheese tastes better and is cheaper than regular cheese, not because it's more environmentally friendly or less cruel. Companies are going to invest in plant-based alternatives because it makes them money, not because they suddenly have become a, bo a board of saints. Yes. I mean, yes, I agree with you. And at the same time, I am a very, very hopeful person. And I am uh, betting on the continued evolution of humankind towards being humane. I really, mm -hmm. truly believe that humankind can, uh, can evolve and become better. I think we're already better than we were 200 years ago when 
um, we enslaved our own species. Um, what, go back to the, the ancient, the golden age of Greece when half the population consisted of slaves. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the first democracy. So humans have evolved, we have gotten better. And I do believe that humans can continue to get better. I'm not giving up on that. And I will continue to talk about the ethics, not just push flavor, because I believe that we do have to make uh, improvements in our own human condition. Right. But, you know, I found that it's, it's much easier to talk to someone who's gone plant-based for their health, to talk to them about environment and animal welfare than while they're still eating meat and drinking dairy. Like, yes. like, like once, once they've taken the, the, the hedonistic step, right. Right. That's then it's exactly much, it's, right. it's much easier for them to be in um, alignment with their identity to say, Oh, well, maybe I can look into these other things. Cause I'm, I, I'm not, my, my coherence isn't threatened anymore. That's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, people are individuals are self-centered and they have to uh, do what feels good for them initially. And then, then and only then can they actually start thinking about other things outside of themselves. So one of the things I'm hearing is sort of a theme in your approach to life is you don't know and you're gonna try things and find out. That's right? exactly like, right. I don't like, have the answers. Like I heard that in terms of how you create your recipes, how you create your processes, how you start a company, how you navigate the world. Um, that's, you know, when you talk about vegans being their worst enemies, like with any sort of passionate group, there can be um, a dogma that coagulates yes. around, I am right and they are wrong. And I hear very clearly that there's areas where you, you know, you believe that your ethics are correct and should be widely adopted. And there's also a lot of areas where you're extremely humble. Yeah. I mean, I, there, I mean, there's a lot, I don't know. I mean, the one thing I am certain of, and I guess there's a humility to that, there's also a pride to that, is that I think the only thing I'm certain of is that um, love and compassion um, are what matters in the world and everything else is secondary. Um, and so you have to look at life through that lens. Um, it doesn't matter if you win just because you, your opinion is right. Um, I have this conversation with someone in my family all the time, but um, ultimately, if being right means you drive people away, if being right means that you end up alone in the world, um, if being right leads to a sense of anger and that self-righteousness and pride, then it's probably not the right, you're probably not right. Mm. Um, because there's no... Being right is a giving, means that you have a flowing over, an overabundance of love that flows outward. It's a caring. Being right is about caring. It's not about self-protection. It's, um, it's not about winning uh, an argument. It's not about um, winning an argument against somebody. It's about winning together. And if we can't win together, then maybe you might want to question your sense of righteousness. Mm. So I'm curious whether, you know, you talked about your evolution in, uh, around business, that it can be a force for good. And there's so much sort of about our capitalist system that kind of argues against the idea that love and compassion are the driving factors. I'm wondering as, as you're on your journey, have you had to change sort of business as usual in any way so that love and compassion can trump profit and growth? Yeah, it, it's so love and compassion, of course, um, plays out in different ways at times. It doesn't mean, you know, sometimes I have, I've had um, hard situations here at Miyoko's, for example, when um, a company grows as fast as we have grown. Um, Sometimes, um, you know, you have to change your team and you have to let people go. And some people um, don't feel that's a very compassionate thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's another way to look at it. If, if those people are struggling to keep up at work, 
letting them stay there isn't very compassionate either because they're not very happy. I remember the very first time I had to let somebody go who had been with me since the beginning. I had four employees in the beginning. And um, this person was with me for, um, gosh, three and a half, four years. And um, uh, this person wasn't able to keep up anymore. I mean, he, the person was no longer, um, you know, what this person had been doing. Um, I, I, well, he just wasn't able to perform. And when I let him go, he said, I was wondering when you're going to let me go. Mm. And he realized himself that um, we were just at a different level. Um, and, but he wasn't going to quit. And so, but he wasn't happy. You could see that he wasn't happy. So, you know, in some ways you could say, well, why did you let an original person go? But on the other hand, you know, he's probably much happier today because we all have to find our, our perfect spot in the world, wherever that is. Um, but in terms of like my own business, uh, I, I've made a conscientious effort to create a culture that uh, benefits people. Um, and I'm not saying everyone is happy. There are people that are always going to complain um, and be unhappy. And then there are many that, you know, come to me. Like I had somebody come to me yesterday and say, I just want to thank you for starting this company. I finally have a place I love working. But, you know, for example, we have a lunch program, we have a meal program. So we're, even though we're not Google, um, you know, we feed our entire staff. Uh, there's always food, there's a hub. Um, we chose this particular location because it had this beautiful courtyard because I wanted a place where people, in, you know, in, employees could enjoy uh, their work environment rather than just reporting to work. I find it really depressing when, you know, you're, you're caught inside somewhere and then you have to go out eat in the parking lot or something. And you can, you know, so even though we're not Google or, you know, Dropbox and we don't have these, we don't have a big fancy uh, uh, building, um, you know, we wanted someplace that was really enjoyable for what we have here. Um, we have, uh, I think, you know, we pay, we're a B Corp. And so we try to abide by all of their, their standards. We, you know, uh, living wages, we have a robust um, benefits program, um, PTO, all of that stuff, which oftentimes, you know, you, you don't find with smaller food companies or startups. Um, mm. And can I, can I just connect yeah. that to the fact yeah. that your cheese, your, a wheel of your cheese can cost $9 in the supermarket? Yes. Like, it's, it's so easy for me to just get angry at prices, especially if I've, you know, entrained onto a different price. But to think for people to think about where the money is going and, and when it's cheaper, where the money doesn't go. Yeah. And, you know, I want people to know we're not profitable. We're still not profitable. So, um, yeah, I guess, you know, if I paid everyone minimum wage and didn't provide any benefits, we probably could have been profitable by now, but I don't think that's the way to do it. We've also checked our supply chain. You know, I went to Vietnam and visited uh, the cashew processing facility to make sure that their workers were, uh, were treated well and were safe and, uh, um, was very happy with, with what I found there, uh, read their third party audit. You know, there's a lot we've done to make, to assure that we're not always paying the cheapest price for our supply chain because we're making sure that we're getting, uh, not just quality ingredients, but, uh, quality, um, a quality, you know, we're buying from a quality company that's taking care of their employees, et cetera. Um, we also have to remind you that the reason, you know, our cheese wheel, that's $9 is $9 because we don't get government subsidies, <laughs> from, you know, that, that like the dairy industry does. And if the dairy industry were to lose their subsidies, um, I don't know how much a block of cheese would cost. Um, but, you know, we're also with scale, we have introduced products that are a lower price point and we will continue to innovate and produce products that are going to be more competitively priced with our animal dairy counterparts. Speaking of innovation, how much time do you get to play in the kitchen these days to create cheese? Very little. Um, I do work, I do head up the R&D department 
Um, so I do work with them. And a lot of the um, products that we're working on were, um, so we have like a cottage cheese that's rolling out that has about 10 grams of protein per serving. And um, it's with a, a very, very novel plant milk. It's fully organic, uh, really clean uh, ingredients, but, and there's no added oils or anything. Um, while I didn't, um, the way that started was me playing around the kitchen with different plant milks and, and doing different things and finding a way to curdle this one plant milk to make curds. Mm -hmm. um, after I figured that out, I brought it in to the R&D lab and said, look, look at the curds that I got. They're like cottage cheese now. I want you guys to make cottage cheese out of this. So I still contribute to a lot of ideas. I still contribute to some of the initial uh, processes um, that spur the development of a product, but I don't have the bench time available to be, you know, innovating um, every single day for eight hours a day. I mean, that's what it takes. Mm -hmm. do, do you do you want to? Would you love to like fire yourself as CEO and just go back to the kitchen and, and hire a CEO, or do you like the the role you're in? I like the role I'm in. I'm still able to innovate. I still I still play around with stuff. For example, um, I took the cottage cheese home uh, recently, and I thought, huh, if I brine this, I could make feta crumbles out of it. And so I did that. And then I brought it in to R and D and said, look, I got something that's like feta. Now make it better. Um, and then uh, I took some more curds home, and I grew. Uh, started growing some blue mold in it in my refrigerator, for example, to make blue cheese. So I'm still playing around uh, in the initial uh, phase, but then, um, but I get to do a lot more stuff. I get to have, do podcasts with you, for example, or, you know, I get to do cooking shows. I get to do more marketing. I mean, I'm able to use my creativity in other ways as well. Um, and so I think, you know, overall, um, I like what I'm doing being more of the, the visionary that leads the company forward. If I were only on the bench, I would be product focused. I think that's one of the mistakes a lot of entrepreneurs make. They think that the, the product is the company. The product is not the company. You have to have a great product, but the company is, is how you communicate that, the vision, the, um, the marketing, it's, it's, uh, it's everything else that it, it's also the company itself, the culture, that's also important. It's all the people that you hire that are going to help you take it to the next level. Um, and so, you know, just being stuck in R and D, I would have to hire somebody else to be the visionary, to lead the company forward. And I don't want to do that. I want to be the visionary. Mm -hmm. gotcha. So are you happy that you named the company after yourself? I am. And that was after hiring. We actually hired a, a naming specialist who <laughs> gave us something like 300 names. And we went through all of them. And finally, it was like, just going to call it Miyoko's Kitchen. Uh -huh. And now it's just Miyoko's. But. Uh -huh. So what, what, have, what have the advantages? I, I imagine there, I don't know, there may be some downsides to that as well. But what, what, what have I you seen? I think the downside is for a long time, people kept calling it Mykonos. Oh, Oh, that's the Greek company. Uh -huh. so that's one downside. <laughs> um, people are be able to pronounce it. Is it Mayokas? But, you know, then again, you think about brands like Chobani or some of these others that have sort of interesting names as well, too. And you realize, you know what? Consumers can learn. Yeah. Um, so um, I think what, it's, it's a, yeah. What about, for, I mean, for you personally to... Like, it's, it must, it must, it, it would be very different if you were the... CEO of Miyoko's that so like in you know insider industry insiders knew about versus you know you can get people to drop their jaws in a uh, in European cheese shops. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's it's uh, I think people like having a, a face associated with a brand. You know, if you think about Bob's Red Mill, for example, mm. uh, Bob is real, and at Expo West he leads a marching band down the aisles. I don't know if you've ever seen him, no. but people get, a, you know, he's a hoot. People get a thrill out of the fact that there is a real guy named Bob and he gave his company away in the end to all his employees, um, I believe. So, you know, people love that sort of story, you know, or Ben and Jerry's or whatever. People love the fact that there's actually a person behind a brand. And mm -hmm. I think that's been one of the reasons for the success of our company. If I'd called it, um, I think initially I had a, 
I wanted to, what was it? It was like, it wasn't blue dog. What I can't remember. Um, but I was going to call it something dog. Um, I, <laughs> I have, you know, two dogs at the time and I don't remember what it was. I don't know, fun dog creamery or something like that. Um, and no one would have known, you know, I don't know if it would have gotten to where it is today had I not called it this. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining it also um, can really focuses you on the ethics, right? That this is a representation of you. It's yes, it, yes. more than it would be if it was just the company That's you right. started. Yeah. I mean, I think people want to know that there's a real person, that there's, there is a real vision. There's real meaning behind a brand rather than just, it's just another corporation just doing whatever and who knows who's running it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a degree of comfort. And also I've tried to make myself more accessible, which can be a problem sometimes, but, you know, I really do like connecting with people. I mean, that's why I did this cooking show and, you know, this, and it was Facebook live because I actually liked interacting with comments live because I don't know, it makes me feel more connected. Like I, I find it harder to just record something when I don't have an audience. I like being connected with an audience. It keeps it real. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, your, your presentations at uh, the Veg Fest have always been, you know, hugely fun. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, last minute, um, you're doing work with um, sanctuaries? Yeah, I have a sanctuary, a farmed animal sanctuary, uh, or I started a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, my daughter is the, my youngest daughter is the, uh, the sanctuary manager, and we have another employee and volunteers. And uh, we're, we're, uh, we also support other sanctuaries. So at Miyoko's, we donate to uh, other sanctuaries as well. Um, not all of them, obviously, there are so many, but um, you know, we try to support as many as we can. Um, I really do believe that sanctuaries are a wonderful way to connect people's hearts to the lives of animals and help them really think about the ethics of animal agriculture. So I'm a big proponent of sanctuaries. Gotcha. Is yours open to the public? It is. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Where is it? It's in uh, West Marin. It's in uh, a little town called Nicasio. Okay. About 45 minutes north of San Francisco. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's been so lovely to catch up with you, to hear, hear your thoughts and to, to celebrate your evolution and your journey and, and the huge impact you've had on so many people's lives. So I'm, I'm really happy and honored to have had this hour with you. Well, thank you. It's been uh, great connecting with you again. All right. Well, may you go from strength to strength. All right. You too.